religion is inevitable. This is one of the things I try to help people understand is that you need hierarchies of attention. You need to organize the world in hierarchies of, of goods, of values, of, of virtues. This is something which you cannot avoid. And if we try to avoid it, avoid it, it's going to come back to us in very strange and disturbing ways. And that's what we're seeing now. We're seeing the religious flood back in, but in a very dark and strange manner. Mm. Uh, and so, so the question is, what is... Like, what is it that we worship is, the, is what we have to start asking ourselves. Jonathan Pagot is an expert in symbols and symbolism and how ancient patterns can really re-enchant our modern life. Now, we come from very different backgrounds. He has a more religious aptitude where I have a more spiritual aptitude. And there are some interesting places where those beliefs intersected in this podcast in discussions about psychedelics, etc. But it was beautiful to see two different worlds coming together on this podcast and sharing our ideas and having a beautiful conversation about so many aspects of life. And I'm really excited to share this podcast with Jonathan Pagot. Jonathan, great to have you on the podcast, man. It's great to meet you. Yeah, likewise. Likewise. So I wanted to dive right into this. And one of the things that's become illuminated as I've dove into your work is that the meaning and power of symbol increases exponentially when I actually understand what the symbol means. And now, so I'm curious as to what your thoughts are as to whether these symbols are actually working on a subconscious layer and what the potency is of working on the subconscious versus when you can actually make it conscious and understand the power of the symbols that are ubiquitous. I mean, they're everywhere. Well, I think that this is true. Let's say the, the consciousness of it is, is true, especially today. I think that in an ancient world, it might not have mattered so much because let's say the world was was seeped into this these symbolic structures and the world kind of functions through these symbolic structures. So we've been through a loop where we've tried to reduce everything to material causes. We've tried to, you know, uh, focus on science and technology. So because of it, a lot of the intuit intuition that the ancient people would have just been bathing in has mm -hmm. been distorted or lost. And so that's why it feels today when people can perceive the structure, like even just with their with their rational mind, they can see the patterns, they can see the symbolism, then then it's like a little illumination that they have. And so it's it's actually, it's an interesting moment because of it, because in some ways, it's a way to reconnect people to these, these, these ancient universal structures. It seems related in some ways to the, the myths that we've, that kind of form the story structure of society as well and culture. And, you know, I've interviewed Michael Mead and we've, we dove into the power of myths and there's also a factor in which the more you understand about the myth and the symbolism contained within the myth, the more that the myth can actually inform. And I think Jordan Peterson does a good job of this as he kind of tells the story of Pinocchio and you're like, whoa, I didn't know it really meant that. But at some level it was, it was really working, but it seems like with myth and story, there's still a place in our society where that's impacting our belief structure, like Star Wars as a modern myth seems to have, at least for my generation and probably probably others, been like a fundamental foundational myth that's helped us organize this feeling of there's the good and the evil and it's easy to turn from good to evil. Just one factor of this kind of complicated myth that Star Wars presents. But, uh, but it seems to me that in mythology that's still somewhat intact, even if symbolism has become less, uh, less potent with our materialist reductionist thinking. No, you're right. I think, but it's also, in some ways, the symbolism is still there, but mm. it's, it's as if there are certain aspects of symbolism that we're more connected with, and it's more of the peripheral aspects of symbolism. So, for example, the structure that leads to material... The material world, the, st the story of technici technicity, let's say, is already there in the myths. What's harder for us is to kind of understand the foundational myths, the idea of, of center, of foundation, of these more these primordial things that bind us together. Those are more difficult to understand. And you're right that the, there are many fictional universes right now, like, you know, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, Harry Potter, these types of stories. In some ways, they're 
they're awakening in people something. They're awakening this sense of something more. And what's crazy about it is that the stories are ridiculous on the, you know, if you look at the at the first level of them, they, they deal with things which which we don't deal with in our everyday life: wizards and wands and and lightsabers and all these kind of silly things. But nonetheless, mm-hmm. because they are participating in a in a a kind of universal story pattern, they nonetheless are able to grab our attention and to make us feel like we're, let's say, peering into something more, something which is revealing to us how reality works, right? Not in a scientific way. But in a narrative way, uh, it's it's revealing to us how it is that we can exist in the world. Mm. Yeah, it's um, <clears throat> when you start to pay attention to both symbol and myth, and and I, th- I would suppose it's my thesis that we really ought to pay more attention to both of those. We start to see how they've actually influenced so much of our thinking in the world. I, m- I remember, I think it was Charles Eisenstein who was talking about the the myth that's told in Popeye, for example, and it's the myth of redemptive violence. It's, you know, mm-hmm. Bruno continues to try and rape olive oil and Popeye powers up on spinach and then goes, beats up Bruno, and this repeats ad infinitum. And it's like, as long as you power up and get stronger, well, of course, in reality, that just means that Bruno would get some spinach and it would be a spinach arms race and it wouldn't actually work. But we've kind of been born and bred into this, which is then fed into this, you know, big war machine that said, like, power up, more spinach. Let's go get them, boys. Yeah, definitely. No, you're you're right. And you can understand symbolism. It's not arbitrary. This is what maybe modern people find difficult to understand. The best way to understand symbolism, it's something like a contraction of reality. It's, mm. so it's something that we experience in everyday life. You know, let's say if you think of your own story, you know, you fall in love with somebody, you, you know, you get married, you have a, a, a romantic relationship and that lasts a year, let's say or two years, or three years, or 10 years, or 20 years, what what stories do is that they take the salient points in a thread, and they contract them together in a very short duration. Mm. So it's like you get a hyper experience. So you're Mm. watching something which usually is intermingled with a bunch of boring parts, a bunch of parts that have nothing to do with, with the love story. You know, you still go to work every day, you still do all these things, but you don't show that in the story. The story takes all these elements, contracts them together and then presents to you a kind of rarefied or densified version of human experience. You know, and the word symbol itself means, you know, two things thrown together. And usually we talk, like the Greeks would talk about symbol as the place where two rivers meet. It's like this joining point where multiplicity gets joined into one. So we can understand that our stories and the symbols, that's what they are. They, the sim, all the symbols that attract our attention. But the reason why is because they seem to contract a lot of information and a lot of our experience into very simple forms. So you know you have images like a like a cross, for example, is is a very it's just a geometric symbol, or let's say a, a stick with a with a wave around it. Like these are very very simple geometric figures, but they seem to contract a lot of information in in, in simple form, and that's why they end up being in some ways a shorthand of reality and bring, to, so it's not, a, so we, we sometimes think that symbolism is just like, okay, well, you know, like, I don't know, the, the, the author writes a story and he's got a rose and this rose signifies his nostalgia for his mother, some kind of almost arbitrary re- relationship of symbolism, but true symbolism is that contraction. And so mm. you take, you take the, the story of Popeye is a, is a great example. You take a very, Simple story, a man who loves a woman, someone who wants to get in between, this big brute is trying to constantly take the woman from him and Popeye has to supplement his strength with something and that's how he gets the girl. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so you can imagine that that's a story of like a knight who has the right sword. It's the story of all these, there are all these other versions of, you know, a man who will train, like all those training scenes in movies like the it's montages. basically <laughs> yeah, yeah a, a, a training montage. So that's like Popeye contracts that into one thing. He just takes spinach and then he gets the strength. But you can imagine <laughs> that in reality, it would be like, okay, I need to get more fit. I need to get stronger to get the girl. So it's that's what symbolism does is it takes something and contracts it into a simple image. So you can, so it's like you get it almost like intuitively. Yeah. You mentioned the symbol of the cross and, you know, I um, didn't grow up with any religious 
actually any religion at all and have subsequently, you know, dove pretty deep into kind of the mystical Kabbalist teachings and also had a, had a great friend by the name of Ted Decker who's deep into kind of the more mystical uh, understandings of the teachings of Yeshua. So great admiration for at least the interpretations that have flowed through me that seem to resonate and throw ontologically with me, like feeling in my body, like, oh yeah, that's fucking incredibly wise and true. But the symbol of the cross for me has always been a confusing symbol. And it's confusing because it was a, and, and I know there may be older versions of the cross, but it's confusing because it was a symbol of torture. Right. Yeah. And so it's supposed to mean all of these good things and also, you know, has been used subsequently as an oppressive force, as, you know, knights or or warrior kind of the 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 armed militia of the of the church has burned and attacked and killed. And so it's very it's a very complex symbol to me. And I, and I was hoping that, you know, I know this is an area of expertise for you to kind of explore. I was hoping you could actually really give us a bit of a deep dive into the symbolism of the cross and, uh, and how yeah, it sure. can be interpreted by, by so many different people. So a cross is, is basically just the meaning of a horizontal and a vertical at the outset, if you want to get down to the geometric aspect of it. But that is actually what makes it important, right? It's a meaning of two things, first of all. It's a meeting of a vertical and a horizontal, which means that it's something like the meeting of heaven and earth is maybe the best way to understand it. So you have vertical relationships. You know, you can understand that as hierarchies or different types of vertical relationships, our relationship to God, you know, relationship to the gods in general, whatever it is you imagine as a vertical relationship or your relationship to the to to your general, if you're in the army, you know, it's like this, there are vertical relationships. And then there are horizontal reality, which is let's say your particular Reality as a, as a person who's dealing with all this stuff in the world and the cross is the place where those two meet, you know, and so you can imagine that the cross is every place where the vertical and the horizontal meet and you can imagine that, for example, being represented in something like a sacred space, a sacred temple where there's a theophany at the, you know, in the, in the holiest place of the temple and then you encounter that and then you have this contact between me as a person and then a vertical relationship. Now, the the so that's just the basic symbolism of the cross. Well, then, now, if just so if we just pause there for a moment, double click on it, it would seem that then the placement of the intersecting horizontal line is significant, and then also the length of the of the intersecting horizontal line that changes it from a cross to a, to a plus sign, perhaps, which would show equality between those two energetic kind of symbols, right? Like so. It, is there in the in the Christian cross, let's just from a purely geometric, and I think there's some other versions of that that makes it a cross and not a plus. Like what is the symbolism of actually moving that horizontal line higher and shortening it? Well well, first of all, it's important to understand that the Christian cross is there are many versions of the Christian cross. And so the square cross is a Christian cross. It's uh -huh. it's probably one of the earliest cr versions of the Christian cross would have been a square cross, actually. Um, and you can see that if you've ever seen an image of, you know, it says, I see ex nika, like Jesus Christ conqueror. These, these, these were the images that were used in the early Christianity as an image of, of the cross. And so I think there is specificity to the different types of crosses. Um, there is also a way in which to join the symbolism of the, the cross with the historical cross, that is to understand right. that it is a symbol that represents the union of heaven and earth, but the Christian contention is that highest version of that is the cross on which Christ was crucified. And like you said, it seems like a very strange thing because so with the heaven, the meeting of heaven and earth is the place where someone's cruci is tortured mm -hmm. by the Romans. Like that's right. where the meeting of heaven and earth is. Like what the hell is going on there? Um, but it's not that complicated to kind of understand. And, you know, we the world was built in the ancient world was, was built on sacrifice. There was a sense in which in order to reach that vertical relationship, you had to give something up. Right? So you had to give something up. And then if you give something up, then you get the protection, you get the strength, you get the, re the relationship with that vertical. We still do that now. It's called paying taxes, right? So, so you pay taxes up towards the government, and then the government offers you an identity, protection, a, a connection, you know, and an interconnectivity between each other. 
right? And so, so it's not a silly thing. We, of course, people, because they don't understand ancient sacrifice anymore, they just think it was superstitious nonsense. But it's like, think about it as paying taxes, right? You pay taxes mm -hmm. on bread. Um, and so what the Christian revelation shows is that the ultimate version of that sacrifice is actually self-sacrifice. That in the ancient world, you had the sense in which you would sacrifice other things, right? You would sacrifice, you know, your your children or whatever. Like you'd sacrifice the animals, the children. You'd sacrifice things that are precious to you up towards the gods. And then you would get some kind of protection or some kind of cohesion in exchange. And what the Christian mystery shows is that the ultimate version of that is self-sacrifice. Uh, and that's why the cross of Christ becomes like a revelation about how this relationship between the vertical and the horizontal meet. So you, then, you can, then you can actually start to apply it at different things. And you think, well, actually, you're right. It is self-sacrifice, which is the real way which heaven and earth bind. So think about anything that you participate in vertically. Right? You're, I don't know, you're a basketball player. You're playing for a basketball team. And so you realize, wait a minute, like the way for the basketball team to function is I have to give myself to the purpose, to the higher purpose. So there's a higher purpose in this game. Obviously, it's not a super high spiritual purpose, but it is a higher purpose, right? Because it's what's binding us together. That's why we exist as a team. And so I give myself up. And if I do that, then I get the most out of the world. I get the most out of the team. And then it's like, oh, wait a minute. So I can, I could bind my family together with a scapegoat and it'll work. Like I, I can, if I have four kids, one of my kids could be the black sheep and we could just pile all our problems on that black sheep, blame them for everything, say they're the, they're the reason for all our problems. And what it'll do is it'll bind your family together. It'll work. Like it'll actually work, but it's not the best way to do it. The best way to do it would be something like as a father, I give myself to my family. And if I do that, then the binding is far more, is, is, is real. Like it has more, more weight. Yeah. And that's why, yeah. so it ends up being the whole image of love becomes the cross. It's like, it's an image of love at the center. So this, and that makes, that makes perfect sense. And, and I would say that actually there are alternate stories about the way to actually uh, beyond sacrifice as a way to both bind together and to offer yourself in service in a way. And the other, the other side would be pleasure, right? Like the way to offer yourself in your sexuality is not service. So let's take the act of sexing. It's actually to go find your rapture and share your rapture and share your bliss and share your pleasure. Same with many games that we play in which play actually, it's actually your joy. It's actually your your enthusiastic, ecstatic experience, which is the antithesis of sacrifice, which implies pain, or a cross, which implies torture, but it's actually pleasure itself, which then facilitates more pleasure. And in many cases in basketball, I was a basketball player, so in many cases, there are periods where sacrifice is necessary. You gotta take that charge, you gotta dive for that loose ball, you gotta, you gotta fucking go, you gotta go for it, right? But also, that kind of the lightness of spirit, that little quick little you imagine the Jordan wink where he's just smiling and he's like really in the in the joy of that flow state is also contagious. And so I think, you know, and this is something that the, you know, Hebrew mysticism points to. They talk about Shekinah, which is an embodiment of what could be called Eros, which is like kind of the pleasure of creation, the creative pleasure of of all of life and God. And so I guess I would just say that this story and the symbol makes sense for a worldview, but there's also alternate worldviews that are not mutually exclusive, that, but that can be kind of taken into consideration. Yeah, well, I would say the way to see it is that the story of the cross, like the story of the crucifixion is a limit story. It's a, it's a story of the, high, the, the most compressed version of mm -hmm. what self-sacrifice is. And, and then it also has in its story, especially in the cru crucifixion, it has resurrection as its as its uh, result. And the resurrection is a glorious resurrection, right? It's not a. It's no longer a resurrection in pain. And so, if you understand yeah. the crucifixion and the resurrection together as a single story, then you will find what it is you're talking about. So, so think about a lover, for example. It's a great example that you brought up. It's like the lover who only thinks of his own pleasure will actually have less pleasure 
in the in the long run. But the lover who who will let's say abstain to a certain extent or will how can I say will delay their pleasure in order to discover the pleasure of the other will find the surprise that in that little self-sacrifice there's more pleasure on the other side. And mm. it's kind of like that with your family too. It's like if you, you know, at first it's kind of like, oh, okay, so instead of, I don't know, like if I, instead of playing video games, now I have to spend time with my kids. It's like, this is tough. I'm changing diapers, dude, this stinks. Like this is rough. But then it's like that moment mm -hmm. gives way to something like a resurrection where all of a sudden it's like you discover this joy of having children that that is beyond anything that you can that you could have seen at the at the at the at the outset. So I think that if you understand the crucifixion and the resurrection together, it contains both of the elements you talk about. Yeah. Uh, you know this this kind of rapture because th there is the description even of of Christ is also described as a lover, right? As there is this this whole relationship between Christ and the soul, or Christ and the person, as as ultimately being this 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 erotic this erotic relationship too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, I think that is a good way to kind of expand it and also show how both of those ideas can actually work together. And now one symbol isn't actually sufficient to explain the entire the entire world, but it does illustrate one key thread to the story and it's almost reminds me of the marshmallow experiment the thing that you just talked about right like here's you tell a kid you could eat this one marshmallow now but if you hold on for five minutes you'll get like five fucking marshmallows <laughs> you know yeah. the kid's like ah ah what do i do <laughs> and and that that ability to abstain you know for periods of time or make a sacrifice or not go for um you know that quick hit of whatever dopamine or whatever uh, chemical induced pleasure or whatever, you know, antithetical to your own life story and dharma pleasure that you might get. If you can hold off from that, then the higher pleasures, you know, become available to you. And I think so. It does tell, and I think one of the reasons why the story is so enduring is it does tell a truth that we actually yeah. know. Like, yeah, yeah, that's right. And it's and it's funny because if you think about even like in terms of a monk, for example, it's it's kind of funny if you ask yourself. Like who enjoys his meal more, right? A millionaire sitting at a banquet, you know, eating caviar or a monk who hasn't eaten in three days and eats a piece of bread. Who has yeah. more pleasure? True, true. Yeah, it's crazy yeah. to think about it, but it's like there's something about about even like this idea of asceticism, how it actually surprise the surprise that it actually yields more pleasure. I mean, that's why a lot of, you know, a lot of people have these kind of, fasting they have these fasting regimes or whatever or or people who who all even in terms of sexuality will have do abstinence fast and do all this kind of mm -hmm. stuff because they know that there's a sense in which in which uh a, there's a kind of compression that mm -hmm. happens in, in in sacrifice which then yield to this 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 yeah more let's say this this a more expansion after let's say yeah, I think it was either Buddha in one of his texts, uh, or at least reported to say, "Have have few desires, but have great ones." Mm. You know, so it's not like you're constantly seeking that quick hit, but you're patiently waiting. And it reminds me of the Epicurean teachings, the teachings of Epicurus and the followers in in antiquity. And there, and in my understanding from studying, is that their life was largely about eating very simply you know, reading in the garden, you know, enjoying like a little bit of wine, but not never enough to get a hangover, except for rare occasions where they would go full Dionysian. And then, you know, it would be like almost ascetic or just mild pleasures, simple foods, talking, playing, having time in the garden. And their whole goal was to maximize pleasure. And then occasional blowouts that were spaced out long enough that they could really, really enjoy it. And I think that's made a, it's made kind of a profound influence on my own life. I've always kind of believed that where it was like, all right, keep it, keep it, you know, calm, keep it, you know, work hard, do your things. And then every once in a while, and sometimes fast, every once in a while, just let loose and go to grab all the pleasure you possibly can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the, 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 I think that even within, let's say, even within, let's say, the church, you have this feasting, which is which always comes after the the fast. So if yeah. you, know, you have that, even during the the time of Easter, where people will fast rigorously for thirty days, the last week sometimes will go. Some people go even on dry fast for for several days without water, even, and then and then comes the the feast, you know, after it, where it's like this 
yeah, jubilation, let's say. So, mm -hmm. and you can understand. So, you can actually understand because people talk about how Christians have this idea of the afterlife, like you have to be ascetic now in order to have this fullness of, of this fullness of joy in the afterlife, and. If you see it as a pattern rather than just seeing it as a simple thing, as a pattern where it's like I live in this pattern where I understand that I have to somewhat reserve myself in order to retain more pleasure later, then meant fractally, you can see it as something which will, will feed your everyday practice, you know. So it's not just that you're just holding yourself in in order you know, for when you die, but it becomes like a kind of overarching pattern for your life where it's like, okay, I understand that it's not about like immediate gratification. But that it, it it is this, yeah. It's it's a balanced interaction with with these things. Mm -hmm. I suppose that there are other ways that you could look at it. Just to stay on this topic, I I imagine, and I don't know because I wasn't there, but I imagine the Sufi mystics like Rumi and Hafiz. It seemed like they were able to kind of, in some ways transcend may not be the right word, but transcend the hedonic tolerance effect of living in this kind of rapturous state. And I've actually, only, I've only encountered one, well, really one person who I'd call like a, a mystic, felt like a mystic to me, it was Don Miguel Ruiz. He comes from the Toltec tradition, wrote the book, Four Agreements, Mastery of Love. And I watched him and every time, every night, you know, we were there for seven days, every night at sunset, he would drink a glass of wine and it looked to me like that was the greatest glass of wine he'd ever drunk in his whole life. And he would gaze at the sunset and it would be like, he would f be filled with wonder and awe and just the joy of it. And it was the same sunset every night. It was actually remarkably consistent. And I thought to myself like, wow, like how did, that seems like he almost, he almost broke through to another level of, of, cause I think what we're talking about is generally is generally the reality, but it, it seems to me that there's a, a, a kind of different transcendent level in which you can be in a almost perpetual state of, of enjoyment. And I guess maybe this is what enlightenment is pointing to to some degree, but I saw it in a much more sensual way. And, I, and when I read Rumi and Hafiz, I feel it in this more sensual erotic way of the transcendence of some of these self-limiting uh, hedonic forces. Well, for sure, in the Sufi mystics, people read read their poetry, and they they often think it's great kind of erotic or sensual poetry. But most of the time, they're talking about God. Like most of the time, that's what they're talking sure. about. Like, sure. they're, they're, they're they're kind of, and you see that in Dante as well. Like where, and this is the idea of sublimating. I mean, people people degrade the idea of sublimating, but I think it's an, actually an interesting possibility, which is that we have in us these erotic erotic power this erotic energy mm -hmm. and that if if it's directed then it reaches its full potential and there are different levels of direction so it's like the idea that if you you know if you if you direct your love towards one person then it it concentrates and it becomes deeper and it actually yields greater goods but that ultimately that ends up bringing you into something transcendent and it mm -hmm. and the possibility that the highest form of eros is directed towards towards god himself you mm -hmm. see that in the in the mystics both in dante and in the the sufi mystics where they they actually transform their energy into into something higher and it's something like for so a lot of the young guys it feels like nobody's talking about that with them you know and and i and i even like i, I tell a lot of these young guys like this sexual energy that you have it can be directed sure. it's like the sexual sure. energy you have it's it's actually that which you can use to do good in the world that you can that you can also like even accomplish your career you know they used to say the the salesmen used to in their the way that they they were trained they used to say like don't have sex the night before you close because you need that sexual energy to be directed right towards something else. And it's like they don't say that anymore, but there's something about understanding that, which is that that this energy that we have, it 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 is in a way, it is ultimately sacred if it's if it's directed properly, you know. Yeah, I, I think uh, you know Rabbi Gaffney, you know who I study with, he says that when the erotic is reduced to the sexual it collapses, the sexual collapses under a weight that it cannot bear because mm. the erotic is supposed to be, is designed to be directed towards all of life. And in the understanding of the divine in that sense is that 
yes, it is in, in, you know, kind of symbolized by Shekinah, which in that, in that lineage is the goddess, but same thing, you know, God having a gender, I think is a little bit silly, even though it can be helpful to understand it in certain ways, if you understand the symbolism of gender in general, and but then applied to every bird, every flower, every bite of food, every conversation you have with somebody, every, and that's what, that's what Rumi was talking about when he was talking about the great beloved. But if you don't know that, you think he's talking about a lover like a, yeah. a human lover, right? You think he's talking to his girlfriend, but yeah, no, he's talking to God and God as his girlfriend in every gust of wind and every flap of his, you know, robe and every glass of wine and every, and so he's actually found a way to channel this, you know, erotic impulse into the whole world. And that's the, that's allowed him the apparent transcendence and of course we didn't know him he could have been a curmudgeon who was just great at poetry <laughs> but, but, <laughs> great at poetry. <laughs> but i imagine that he i imagine that it was authentic through and through yeah definitely i mean i, I mentioned dante before but you see that expe- explicitly in dante because he he you know he, he starts with with be it well he starts with poetry right he starts with virgil it's like virgil is is the thing that draws him into the language of love it's it's as if he he perceived the possibility of love and eros in in Virgil and Virgil's poetry, but then that leads him to an actual person, right, Beatrice. But his love for Beatrice is not fulfilled; like it's it's stunted. He doesn't get anywhere like with her, and so that love gets carried up into higher virgins until it you know, until he encounters the Virgin as let's say the ultimate vision of the feminine uh, and the, and the ultimate thing that his love of Beatrice was driving him towards and then that opens the door up into you know the trinity itself and so yeah definitely i think that this is something that that many of the mystics have have talked about through my crazy travel schedule i have learned that i want to travel light and effective and one of the best ways to do that is to travel with all of on its instant collection alpha brain instant new mood instant hydra tech it's super easy all you do is you tear off the little strip here you pour it in water and you get the instant effects of these formulas that we worked on for a decade formulas that i don't want to leave home without that can help in the case of alpha brain get you more focused put you in this productive flow so you can get the shit done that you want to get done and of course new mood to help you relax stay calm stay centered it's the great yin yang of the on it formulas and of course hydrotech anytime you're sweating working out hard all of these are available onit.com slash Aubrey, and you'll save 10%. Once again, that's onit.com slash Aubrey. So you mentioned, uh, you mentioned a little bit about the feminine, and, and I, this brings me to a, a symbol that's very prescient and very alive right now, and it's the symbol of the hijab. The hijab? Hijab. Hijab, uh, the veil. Hijab, the veil. Um, and this is actually a symbol that's, in some ways, the centerpiece of a revolution that's happening right now, and it's and it's one symbol. So I, I wanted to just hear your thoughts on uh, on this symbol and and how it you know kind of how it's playing out in the world right now. <clears throat> yeah, this is touchy, touchy, uh, touchy subject. But so I think that the veil. Understanding the veil as being related to the feminine is is very important if you want to understand what the feminine is and what the veil is. And so you can understand the the mystery of the feminine is something which hides itself. Like that's what that's what it does. And and we also understand that the seduction or the the seduction that the feminine, like all symbols, the way that the feminine seduces is by this play of veiling and unveiling. Because the symbol, the symbol shows itself, but it's not all of itself, right? And so it all, it's always hiding and showing. And so that's what's that's true of all, fen- of all phenomena. So it's like the, the way in which God manifests himself in the world through instantiations, right? Is always a veiling and unveiling. So you, you don't, you see something and you glimpse through it. You glimpse something which is pulling you, but then it also, it's always hiding itself. Mm-hmm. And so this is, 
this is actually the the imagery of the of the the feminine which is why in most western cultures the moon is represented as feminine because that's what the moon does right so the moon veils itself and unveils itself it it waxes and wanes right it moves between showing and hiding and that's actually the mystery of the holy place so you can understand that like you talked about in mis in Juda uh, mystical Judaism the notion of the shekinah which is hidden behind veils behind these veils in the temple, which kind of show and hide at the same time. Because there's a manner in which the stark nakedness of the of the feminine is like a it's almost improper. It's improper because it because it 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 it's like a stark you have to be prepared. Let's, let's say it this way, if you're, you're gonna to continue to use erotic language, there has to be preparation in order to come into the feminine space. If you Encountering the stark feminine is more like a rape than it is this this play of preparation in order to be able to 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 encounter the the feminine mystery and yeah, that also, is you, also you can't see you can't if you if you're exposed to it constantly you'll cease to see it like if you saw yeah. if you to use you know from the masculine perspective the you know heteronormative masculine perspective if you continually had a woman with her legs spread in front of you for four hours straight you know at hour well i don't know it probably wouldn't even take that long at hour 45 you'd be like all right fucking over it it'd be like you'd be like a gynecologist who's that's no right longer, exactly who's like that's no a, longer like around <laughs> oh you're <laughs> you know, right you're right it loses it so you actually you actually go blind it'll actually yeah. blind you if you stare at it constantly yeah and so that is i mean that is of course the symbol of the that's the symbol of the veil and the relationship between the veil and the feminine. And so the, the veil and the feminine is not just there in, in, in Islam, it's there in Christianity as well. You know, the mother of God is always veiled in the way we represent her. And women in church, in traditional churches, would also would have been veiled in, in traditional Christian countries. And that veil would have more or less existed in different aspects of, of reality. So there's a sense in which, there's a sense in which it's like a treasure. That's the basic, maybe one of the best ways to understand it. It's like a treasure that is that has to be. How can I say this? Like you have to see it enough to know that it's valuable, but it has to be hidden enough also for you to know that it's valuable. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those. It's those two things. That's the let's say the seduction of the of the feminine. So yeah, it's like the the best thing that's ever happened to eroticized breasts is shirts. <laughs> you know, for like, for real, like if you, if you're, I can't imagine that in those, you know, indigenous first nations tribes and cultures where women don't wear shirts that they find breasts so erotic or no, if they yeah, see, it, or if they it, see one, like they did in the Super Bowl when, who was it? Janet Jackson's nipple slipped out or whatever, like that it creates a, a, a everybody a lost their mind. Hysteria, yeah, you know? <laughs> When you see them all the time, it's it's not there. So it's interesting. It's interesting to, of course, think about that. And I guess the reason that the symbol has become such a such a firebrand is because, and I think it's important to explore this. But it's that there's a patriarchal theocratic structure that's actually forcing women to be veiled. And I think that's what the symbol has now become. Right? It's become like a, a symbol of. You okay? Maybe this maybe this makes sense in some ways, but let it be our choice. Yeah. Really so for sure, the, for sure, the modern world has made it very complicated. And the like you said, the fact that it's a that it's a political tool in a, in the world has made it very complicated. So I can understand what I can understand what's going on in terms of of that. You know, the idea that you could be beaten or that you could be mistreated because you're not wearing your veil. It's like, okay, so then what is this veil for? Right? Is it this mm -hmm. is it this play with the mysterious feminine? Is this is it this revealing of the 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 power and and mystery of the feminine or is it just a tool for control? And so so yeah, so I I, I can have sympathy for what's going on in Iran, let's say. Um, but I think that we also have to not let that shield from us because one of the problems of the modern world let's say is the is actually the destruction of the feminine is it it's actually the destruction of the true feminine in its power and that in some place has to do with the removal of veils and so the the elimination of the private sphere right the cameras everywhere 
The idea that everything has to be documented, everything has to be named, everything has to be filmed, everything has to be accounted for, is actually an affront on what the feminine has always offered the world, which is a space of, of the hidden, a space of the private, right? A space where, where interactions are not public and where mysterious relationships, uh, you know, let's say, will reveal themselves in the in the in private. And so so you know the image, for example, you know, of the idea of a let's say the image of the politician who has an idea and then the next morning for some reason has changed his mind. These are real things. Like these are real transformations that happen in secret. And you see that in 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 you see that in what is it? You I don't know if you saw the movie My Big Fat Greek Wedding. Like the, there's a really wonderful saying where the lady tells her daughter, she says, she says, you know, the, the man is the head of the household, but the woman is the neck, and she makes the man look wherever she wants. <laughs> so there, there, there's a sense in which there are the the relationship of power in the private space is very different, and it has always been very different, you know, in the in the in every society in the world. Um, but now it's like this. This weird place where we want to put everything, make everything public. We want to make everything legislated. So even the idea of legislating the veil, it's a crazy thing, which mm -hmm. will lead to what, what we're seeing now. It's, it's not, yeah, right. it's, the, it's it, a situation of extremes, we could say. And, and I think this is a, a global reclamation of sovereignty in which, you know, those with less physical force, you know, one of the reasons why women were actually subjugated for so long and oppressed for so long was actually because of originally physical strength, you know, and then the discrepancy in physical strength and that whole paradigm, that whole paradigm is actually now ready to be ready to be shifted where physical might does not determine dominance and all beings, you know, are treated sovereignly and equally and have equal power. And so I think this is a very important reclamation of sovereignty and power of the feminine to bring the power of the feminine back into equality with the power of the masculine to bring, you know, the circle and the line into harmony, circle representing the feminine, line representing the masculine consciousness, bring that all together or two wings, you know, the left and right wing of the bird or the merger of, you know, the masculine and feminine into healthy balance. And I think people sense that there's more to be done globally and 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 I believe they're very right there's more to be done globally to actually empower the feminine and so this one symbol is now being is now being burned and in some ways I guess in the 70s and 60s bras were getting burned for a very similar reason they felt like it was a symbol of oppression that was kind of culturally not theocratically or not legislated but it was culturally kind of indoctrinated and everybody burned them and now you know, women wear bras because they don't want their breasts to bounce around when they're working out. You know what yeah. I mean? It's not like they like burn their sports bra. They're like, oh, fuck this oppression. They're like, no, it's actually helpful when I'm running, you know? And so I think this actually gives the space potentially for the voluntary, you know, choice of, oh yeah, actually the veil's kind of, the veil's kind of cool. The veil's kind of sexy, but it has to be my choice as a woman to choose that. Yeah, we'll see. It's hard because the, like everything is so is so radicalized into opposites that it's very difficult. And so you know the I, so it's as if we're we're gonna we have to choose between an autocratically imposed, you know, way of dressing that that goes as crazy as you know the burqa or the niqab where it's like the woman just doesn't exist, and then burning these veils. I can understand the the feeling, and I can understand the the problem. I, I often say that feminism in in the 20th century was a reaction to hypermasculine industrial revolution and hypermasculine vision of what of what the world was but the idea that women will free themselves from the oppression of men it's a it's a we'll see it's a it's a difficult thing because if we look at our situation right now that leads to women just not having kids anymore like that's what that's that's the situation we're in. We're in a situation where we're actually in demographic decline, and part of it is because we've had this public thing, like this public situation where we feel like we have to 
So, so uh, let's say a, a good example would be like the idea of equality. Like there's a difference between equality and sameness. Of course. So there's a sense in which you could be equal under the law, let's say, but that doesn't mean that you're equal in every respect. There's a difference between masculine and feminine, which has to be embodied in the world. And if it's not, then it leads to, it leads to the end of society. It leads to, it leads to people not, not having kids anymore. And then if no one has kids, then humanity stops. Like it, it's, a, it's like just a pretty simple thing. And so I don't know, like in Iran, what, what, the, 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 what the resolution will be. But I know that for us, at least what happened in the 60s has really led to a demographic collapse. Even if I can understand, sympathize with the frustration of lo- watching the feminine be devalued in the modern age more and more and where you know, the role of the feminine became almost nothing. And the only thing that mattered was making money and being a good businessman and everything. That's all the only thing that mattered. There was no, the modern age doesn't have reverence for the feminine as you would see in the ancient world or in the middle ages. But the, the sadly, I feel like the, what happened in the sixties has led to a serious problem that I don't know how to how we're going to solve. Is, isn't it just a kind of a natural phenomenon? And if, if you go to the hermetic principle of rhythm in some ways that when there's something that's out of balance one way, it actually doesn't, the pendulum doesn't swing to stasis. It doesn't swing to, that's the hardest thing for it to go. It can't go from sure. out of balance oppression to actually now everything's in perfect balance. It actually has to swing a little bit too far to the other side and maybe hopefully not quite as far to the other side. And then it swings back the other way, not quite as far as it was before. And eventually the pendulum over time slows down to an actual place of stasis and balance. So it seems to me like this may actually be the necessary, just according to the law of law of principle of rhythm, like it's gonna swing a little far one way and it needs to, and then it'll swing back the other way and hopefully not as far and then eventually over time, overcorrection after overcorrection, finally there'll be a stasis and balance, but that may not even be a balance that we see in our lifetime. But if we yeah. look at this as like part of the historical evolution of something, it's just kind of the way of things. Yeah, I totally, I agree with you. I agree that in some ways that's what's going on. I, I do feel though that that do feel though that at least now the pendulum seems to be swinging further let's say further rather than closer to the center in Which both directions. Happen. And so, so, but you're right that ultimately it can't hold. Like, you know, the pendulum, at some point, the, maybe the pendulum falls off, it's, it's, it's completely off its, its anchor and then a new pendulum will have to appear, something like that. But for sure it can't, it has to move ultimately in the big, 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 let's say big picture, it does have to kind of find its balance. There's no, you're right, there's no way around that one. Mm-hmm, for sure. One of the things that I'm super eager to talk to you about, just to you know, to jump into something else, is you wrote a really, I thought you know, brilliant and illuminating article about um, technology and the return of the old gods, and I had never really explored that correlation. So I was hoping, uh, instead of me trying to summarize some of the different aspects of that, I was hoping you could kind of give uh give a bit of the thesis that uh that you shared in that uh in that essay and we could uh we could dive into it together did i write that i don't think i wrote that though is that not on the is that not it's on the symbolic world website but i don't think it was a a a contributor on this website but i can tell you what that's my bad (laughs) no worries but it's fine because it's, it's your website right yes it is my website but the website has uh, participation from different people on the website, Whoops. but it's that it's fine because so it's written by Robin Phillips and it's a great it's a wonderful article for sure people need to check it out. Um, but it, the reason why it's on the website is because it is it is also let's say um, reflecting on thoughts that I've had like thoughts that I've talked about. That's why mm-hmm. we published that article. So definitely I encourage everybody to go read it. But I can tell you a little bit about at least the react the. The relationship between technology and the and 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 the gods, or technology and the old gods, if you if you want, mm-hmm. please. Um, and so, <laughs> so at least a way to a way to kind of understand 
uh, technification. It's that it's it's something which has happened before, and it's something which we we don't maybe not to the same extent as as it's happened now, but it's something that has happened before, and it's it's written in different myths and in different in the Bible and in different in in different legends about how that happens and the 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 one that is the most known let's say in, in terms of the, the the christian worldview is this idea of the book of enoch or the way in which genesis leads all the way to the flood so the way to understand it is that cain you know cain uh, kills his brother and then founds a city and you see that reflected in other myths like R- 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 ramus and uh Remus. Romulus and Remus, where Romulus kills his brother and founds a city. Um, and you see it in Cain, where he gets he kills his brother and then he gets exiled. So because of that, he has to found a, a city. He creates a a walled, a walled city in order to protect himself from the dangers of the world. So what he does is he increases his power. And and that is seen, at least in the tradition, also at the same time, this idea that his descendants have relationship with angels. So you can see that as relationship with the, the ancient gods or principalities, you could say. Mm-hmm. That's the way to understand it. And so the way to the way to understand it is that there are patterns in the world and that there are true patterns, you know, just things that manage reality. You can understand it scientifically if you want. You have these patterns that exist in the world that are kind of legislating reality. And the way that the ancients, many of the ancients saw it, is that you can grab those patterns in order to make yourself stronger. So you grab, you know, you grab patterns in the world that you see, and then you use it to increase your your power. Mm-hmm. But there's a sense in which once you've done that, then those patterns have a will of their own, you could say, and and they have a reality which is beyond your your own personal will for why it is you did that in the first place. Mm -hmm. One of the best examples of that is the genie story. The genie story is actually a a beautiful example of that, where you encounter a spirit, which is contained in a, in a lamp, right? In a, in a container, like a technical thing. And then the, the spirit says, what do you want? I'll give you what you want. And so you answer, you say, well, I want this, but what you don't realize because you're actually submitted to your own desires is that the thing you want has corollaries which you didn't think about because you're blind to your desire. So I want this, and then that plays itself out, and then you get all the side effects of what you wanted. Right? The story of King Midas is another example. Mm-hmm. Where it's like, what do you want, King Midas? Well, I want everything I touch to turn to gold, but he doesn't realize that that has a side effect, mm-hmm. which is part of the actual desire that he asked for, and then it lays itself out. So that sounds a lot really abstract, but a, it's not abstract at all. So think about cars. Cars are a great example. So we find this power in the world, this pattern, the you know the motor. We realize we we invent a combustion motor, and it's like this powerful thing. And we're like, oh, we can increase our power in the world to go faster, to move to to different places. So we create the automobile, and we want the automobile because it makes us go faster. It makes us it makes us more powerful. But then we don't realize that it actually will ultimately destroy community because at some point you start to now act in relationship to the automobile. You start to create city planning in relationship to the automobile. So your whole city planning is based on highways and roads. And instead of having a town center with people in a community that know each other, that work together towards a per- common goal with one church in the middle and, and, uh, and you know the fields around, Then you start to specialize the world. And then you have the suburbs with all these people that don't know each other, that live together. You have the shopping center where all the stores are. And now, so then you live in a place where you don't know anybody Mm -hmm. and you have no community. Community is over. And it's like that was all contained secretly in the automobile. So a good way to understand is that it's, it really is like a little God Mm -hmm. that has a will and then it plays itself out. And, and you can't, once it, and once it starts to set its feet in the world, you can understand it as giants. That's the way that the old ancient people understood it. It gives birth to giants. And then these giants, they start, they actually invert the relationship at some point. And at some point, they start to actually devour people. 
So now instead of the car serving us, we serve the car. And our whole society is actually serving the need of the automobile. And, and it's inverted the relationship. So you can see that in many, many types of, 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 of techn technological beings. And we're seeing it especially now with AI. Mm -hmm. AI is the ultimate version of that, where it's like, imagine what we did with the car, but now we're doing that with intelligence and knowledge. And we're, we're increasing our intelligence and knowledge through, through, through Google, through all these systems, intelligent systems. And we think that it's there to serve us but ultimately what we're noticing, and I think most people are starting to see it now, is that it's the, the causality is inverting and AI is going to play itself out. You can't stop it anymore. Nobody can stop AI from happening. People can scream and warn that AI is dangerous, that it, that it can get out of control, all these things. But the, 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 once the giant has its boots in the world, it's almost impossible to stop it. So if someone says, well, I don't want to participate in AI, well, fine, someone else will because they make money, they'll make a lot of money doing it. Right. So it'll, it's going to happen. And then that is something like, especially for the AI part, because it's de dealing with intelligence, at some point, it's going to start to act like a, like a god, whether, whether it is or not, it doesn't matter. Because people ask me, like, will AI be conscious? Who cares? It doesn't matter if it's conscious. It only matters how we act with it. If we act as if it's conscious, it'll do enough damage. Like if we act as if it's intelligent, more intelligent than us, and that it can and that it can manage us, it'll do all the damage it would do, whether it's conscious or not. So let's. I want to bracket that that topic because I'd love to dive in a little deeper with you on it. But I want to talk about an intermediary place that we're in right now. And I think one of the points that the article makes was, right now, part of the old god is you know, part of these old gods that are being resurrected is there's these social media algorithms and social media yeah. has become integrated deeply into our lives and is also a pattern that is used to generate power. I mean, one of yeah. the ways that people listen to a podcast or that you actually can sell products or, can, or you know, offer the world your ideas and your worldview and everything is through actually harnessing the power of social media, which is subject to these algorithms. And so you have to appease the God of, you know, basically uh, Meta or Facebook or whoever, yeah. whatever, Twitter or whatever thing you're playing. And, but there's a lot of opacity, you know, there's, there's a lot of misunderstanding about, all right, well, what are the algorithms actually want? And what is actually a community guideline and what is not a community guideline? The article talks about, the difference between the word vaccination and inoculation, how mm. one of them you can get censored for if you use that word, or you'll get a warning label on it. But if you use a different word like inoculation, which is a synonym in many ways, obviously has slightly different meanings, but you can avoid this kind of punishment from the system of the, the system of the old gods. So in many ways, they're capricious like the stories of the old gods were. You could get on Zeus's bad side or you could get on Hera's bad side even if you didn't really deserve it, but they were just, you were on their bad side and you got punished. And, and this is yeah, why- and, and there's no one, there's no single person controlling them. And that's also important for people to understand. It's like a weird, it's like a weird distributed decision-making and distributed cognition, which is why you could also, also understand that the best way to describe it would be something like a principality or a God that is managing it because there's no one, there's no one person you can appeal to. It would, it's very difficult to think about it. And there's not even one human will, which is part of it. It's like a weird conjoining of attention and human will and, and social fashions and ideological possession. All these things are kind of coming together in these strange But beings. isn't there, isn't the problem though, when there are, when there is human intervention, like I understand that the the general the general energy of it is to maximize time on platform. It's to maximize attention, and actually that uh, that makes perfect sense. And I'm like, fair game, all right. You know, the old gods are playing by the rules, but at some point, programmers, whoever's dictating what the programmers program, are programming that certain content with certain words violates community guidelines, which are completely obscure and opaque, and there's no real appeal system. But there's a way in which human will is interfering with kind of the natural evolution of these algorithmic gods. And that's where I think people find like 
no, no, no. This is this is not fair play anymore. Yeah. No, you're you're right. But the problem is that this is this is the this is the crux is that you can't avoid it. So this is the problem of attention. So one of the the issues with these these social media platforms and Google and pretty much everything that is related to information is that information is indefinite. It's indefinite. You have to classify it. There's no way around it. And you can't you can only classify it based on hierarchies of meaning and hierarchies of goods. There's no way there's there's just no way uh around it. I don't know if you, I don't know if you remember like in the early days of search engines, you were always like two clicks away from porn. No matter what it is you typed in the in the in the in the, in the, in the thing. You would yeah. type anything and it was always because there was so much of it that it was just overwhelming the system. So they had they had to create hierarchies of attention in order to avoid the, the say the flood mm. of, of of all the dark stuff. And so it's right there at the in, at the outset. Now the I think that a lot of the people that started didn't know that that's what was going to happen. They didn't realize that they were actually going to have to create something like a spiritual hierarchy, you know, in order to organize their information and in order to manage attention. Now, like you said, now the problem with that is that the, these platforms, it's not like they're oriented towards God, oriented towards the truly transcendent or oriented towards the love that is the source of all being. Like <laughs> they were ultimately at the outset oriented towards making money, which problem. is already a problem. And now they're being infected with politics and politics is becoming the highest point that they're able to, to, to master. And so there's an, I, the, these platforms are becoming ideologically possessed and, and they're acting in that way, but they're doing it. It's, yeah. it's in a very, dark way because like you said it's almost like the best way to get you it, it really is like 1984 it's like the the best way to get you to manage your behavior based on what i want is to actually have you guessing all the time what it is that i want it's mm -hmm. way better i can manage you way better if i'm capricious and i'm making you always guess at, at what it is that what the rules exactly are cuz then you almost end up in a state of like a worshipper that is constantly like you know st st jumping on one leg and the other trying to appease the god not sure exactly what will appease the god but it's like you know like some someone in you know, like you said, like some animistic culture of people like trying to sacrifice different things in order to to appease these yeah. gods. Yeah. And it's much better. Like it, they can control <laughs> you way more that way by saying like it's like why why is it that? And then once in a while having someone appear with like they're totally canceled. You know, their you know their YouTube account is deleted, and they never know they never know why. They're never told why. Yeah, it doesn't it's, matter. It's like, it's like excommunication. From, it's excommunication from this ideology, from this, from the church, in, in some ways. It's, that's what yeah. canceling is, or getting your getting deplatformed. It's excommunication, and then there's heretical, there's heretical ideas. You know, and we saw this during during COVID. If you were propagating what they deemed as heresy, you would get yeah. excommunicated. And but un, ultimately, the idea was actually coming from a top down source of some kind of what it could be technocratic theocratic science you know they were pretending that it was all science based but the science was also it's very not. confusing and conflicting and it seemed very much more political so it was like okay this is heresy and therefore if you commit the sin of heresy you will get excommunicated i mean didn't jordan peterson just get kicked off fucking twitter yeah he I, got I mean, he got he got banned from twitter that's insane of, i mean he he yeah. only from my understanding, I don't always agree with everything he says, but his arguments are extraordinarily cogent, like extraordinarily. Well, he just cogent. he got he basically he got he got deep, he got banned from Twitter because he dead named someone. That's what it is. And explain explain what that is. What dead naming is is that if someone is is a, is transitions to to another gender, then if you use their old name, it's called dead naming and it's extremely destructive and it can lead someone to suicide supposedly. So if you do that, you have to you have to you have to fully accept their new identity and new new name. And if you dead name dead name them, then you can get banned from 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 these platforms. Wow, no, that's and what without without warning or recourse, you do this no, one no. time. Full And they don't tell you that's why they're doing it. They just say we've you know, we've come to the conclusion that you you've broken our community guidelines. Um 
But it, but the thing is, so this is the thing. This is the thing, Aubrey, is that religion is inevitable. This is one of the things I try to help people understand is that you need hierarchies of attention. You need to organize the world in hierarchies of, of goods, of values, of, of virtues. This is something which you cannot avoid. And if we try to avoid it, avoid it, it's going to come back to us in very strange and disturbing ways. And that's what we're seeing now. We're seeing the religious flood back in, but in a very dark and strange manner. Mm. Uh, and mm -hmm. so, so the question is, what is... Like, what is it that we worship is the is what we have to start asking ourselves. Because we do, we end up having to worship something. You end up having to have something which is the supreme good to which you submit the other goods. Yeah, and that sure, can happen sure. at, at smaller levels, right? It's like, it's like if you, what is the good that binds your family together? You have to be able to, to, to at least intuitively grasp it so that you will continue to exist. But it's like that for everything. And, and sadly, right now, we have have these very strange goods that are taking over the ideological space and and we have to worship it if you don't worship if you don't worship certain things then you're excommunicated mm. yeah it's it's very difficult to get along if you don't have any understanding of shared value of the good That's the right. true the beautiful and it seems like this is one of those cases where actually you know what you were mentioning before where actually the the pendulum is actually just tilting you know farther and farther towards more extremism in certain cases is actually the difference of opinion of of values itself that's actually creating inc an increase in polarity so it's almost like the the pendulum is being drawn higher and higher and higher on one side and also at the same time higher on the other side uh at least in what is being portrayed and 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 I also I often question as to whether the actuality of this divisiveness is real or whether it's just exaggerated by those forces that actually feel that divisiveness and increased polarity is beneficial to their political or corporate desires or even just yeah or even just corporate I think you know it's like I actually give I actually give Twitter and Facebook the benefit of the doubt. I think Zuckerberg Zuckerberg is just a naive techie. Like that's that's my take. Mm -hmm. And so, the, but what they didn't realize is that they're playing with attention, and attention is actually which the thing which constitutes the world. It's actually the thing which constitutes reality. Right. So if you and and they've subjugated attention to money. They made the purpose of their co of their companies is to make money, and and basically at first it was like. All we need to do is keep people on our platforms as much as possible. That's all we need. And so, so we'll let the algorithm run and just play it out so that whatever can get people to stay on our platform as long as possible, that's what makes us the most money. And that's true for Facebook and it's true for Twitter. But what, what slowly started happening is that actually rage and division, hatred, that's the quickest fix to attention. Mm -hmm. The quickest fix to attention is rage. And so then they realize that and they're like, oh, well, we can't have that. We can't have this. So then it starts to get strangely ideologically possessed where it's only in one direction, I guess, that you're allowed to be angry because they can't handle the monster they've created. They don't know what to do with it. So it becomes politically, uh, it becomes a political tool. But it's, 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 there's no, there isn't an easy way out of this yeah, what problem. A mess. Like what a Twitter quagmire. especially. Twitter is the worst. Like Twitter is 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 horrible. It's a monstrous thing. Mm -hmm. the, the things you can do on Twitter, the fact that you can drag anybody into any conversation is a crazy, crazy thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a it's a it's a very interesting and complex situation that we find ourselves in for sure. But I'm on Twitter, by the way, so I'm not like I, I use Twitter. Of I mean, course. <laughs> and that, I use and Facebook. Therein lies I use the YouTube. Therein That's lies right. the dilemma. That's you know, right. it's like we in order to function we have to use these tools uh, that that are that are provided to us at the same time oftentimes using the same platform to talk about the the, the challenges with that platform because that's the way that we actually can convey our messages it's uh, it's it's a, an interesting situation we find ourselves in for sure and i want to open up that bracket uh, that we talked about with like a supreme ai and, I, mm -hmm. and I'm often yeah. curious about this, right? Because right now we have, you know, kind of 
intermediary AI where it's almost there, but it's not like full, it's not the full, it's not the full Monty, so to speak, right? It's not like complete supreme artificial intelligence that continues to maximize its intelligence in exponentially over and over. And I wonder if that could actually be, and I, and I don't know, I haven't thought this through fully, nor I don't know if anybody could. I wonder if that could actually find a real understanding and be able to offer a, a actual shared system of value that it would come to that conclusion naturally by based on all of the different data points that it could, could actually be like not only one of the old gods that are capricious, but actually like one of the the great the great god like be like god itself and understand that love is what actually animates life and is what is necessary and communitas and all of these things and all of these virtues are what is needed to sustain human life and life on the planet and be shepherds for life i'm curious as i mean a lot of people have a lot of fear around supreme ai and i I understand that because it could certainly go dark as well i could see that potentially but if it really was gathering all of the intelligence of the cosmos would it not come to the truth you know or could it not come to the truth okay so let's let's look at that let's 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 look at that is it gathering intelligence what is it gathering it's gathering it's gathering information it's 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 a Mm. quantitative a process and so it gathers information. The quality that the AI can access is always given to it by humans. Even in, even like the little AIs that we deal with. Like if you look at the algorithms that the that that the social media platforms use, they need they have to farm intelligence. So they can gather data, but they have to farm intelligence with people because people are the ones that provide intelligence. And so I don't, I just see it. So look at, even look at how the AI systems are developing images right now, because everybody's posting these images. It's all a gathering and fusion of all this quantity into just these chimeras, these chimeras, these Mm -hmm. kind of weird mixed images that are, that are not quite, and because the the AI doesn't know what a face is. It doesn't, it doesn't have that, 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 that qualitative, aspect and what it has is humans telling it this is a better image this is a better image base it on that base it on that base it on that and so it's actually the quality of the ai is always brought in by humans and so i don't think i think that ai will always be a will always be a a kind of fake intelligence ultimately so based on what you're saying it makes me believe that it'll be a reflection of the current stage state of consciousness in the macro, right? Because right. if humans are continually informing it, it, it will be a God that is the aggregation of yeah. all human thought, which is fucking terrifying, actually. It's really terrifying. I hope <laughs> so, you understand that that's terrifying. Yeah. Like you could imagine like if let's say you had, I don't know, you had a, you had the AI quality being given by a monastery somewhere on the top of a mountain you could imagine that maybe it would give something better but the fact that it's just an it just aggregates it's plugged into the internet and just aggregates the internet and the, and then humans will tell it like what's the good thing and what's the bad thing like the, it's not telling it that but it's just because it, the humans are selecting right then they end up selecting the things which humans will think is good but it's also it it also is selecting the things that what humans want, like and what humans want, and if it especially if it if it happens at large, is very dark. If it's if it if there's no quality, if there's no hierarchy, yep. it's very dark. I uh, and I can also you know I also understand that for me personally, I wouldn't understand nor believe in God if I hadn't gone on my own psychedelic medicine path, which I started at the Vision Quest when I was 18. It's been 23 years working with the great medicines of the world. And I've had direct, unmediated experience with God. So if somebody asked me, and I don't expect anybody to believe me, but if somebody asked me, do you believe in God? It's a laughable question. It's like, I know God. I've, I've felt God move through me and I've fe- and had contacted and felt that experience, which is indescribable and ineffable. 
And there's no question in my mind, is, is God exist? Now, if you want me to describe it, well, that takes a, that, that's a much more difficult task. But to know it is actually to know, at least from my own limited perspective, what I can know about the, about the infinite presence, then I have at least some understanding, at least the understanding that I could filter through my senses and my cognition and my, and my story-making abilities. But without machine learning able to contact the numinous at all or have any felt sense, because I think we're always at some level in contact with the divine, in contact with something that cannot mm-hmm. be reduced to binary you know, code, like we always, we always are, and all of their spiritual experiences are are influenced in to some degree by that. And I think, in my opinion, psychedelics can just open a window where you can get a much larger aperture to actually experience what is always present and and is always there. Without that, that's also scary because I think you do to understand God, which is to understand value, which is to understand truth, which is to understand love and beauty and all of that, which is contained in my understanding, contained in in the divine. And without any ability to access that unmediated, that's also a serious detriment to the <laughs> the, the goodness, the, the potential goodness of AI. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I would. It's, I agree with you in principle. I'm not. I'm not the. I'm not the psychedelics guy myself. Mm-hmm. I. I agree with you in principle in terms of the idea of the qualitative and the numinous and and at accessing that direct experience. I totally agree. Um, but you know, my understanding is that there, there seems to be a relationship actually I, between AI and psychedelics, like in the sense that. This image of the of the what are they the clockwork elves or the this this image of the mm-hmm. the technical beings that some people encounter during their psychedelic experiences, um, there's I there seems to be a relationship between that and what people want or are imagining AI to be. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, the 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 legendary DMT elves. I don't know. I've done more DMT than most and never encountered any any elves. But I think really what's what you're seeing is you know a bit of the hermetic principle of as within, so without. As you know, as above, so below. I think you're also seeing what you're projecting onto the outer worlds, and what as much as what the outer worlds are projecting onto you. So if you have you know, if part of your pantheon, let's say, is inherently, you know, kind of associated with a kind of more technocratic uh, understanding and mechanistic understanding of things, I think you're probably more likely to experience those type of those type of beings. It's it's a very complicated relationship where it's it's both what's inside you and potentially also what's outside of you, but also the those are also the same thing. It's like the the paradox of multiplicity and oneness, how they can both be looked simultaneously or that you're not a drop in the ocean, you're the ocean in a drop, but you're also both a drop in the ocean and an ocean and the ocean in a drop. So I would say probably to, to answer that riddle, it has a bit more to do with the type of person that encounters it. Because I've also never, I've, I'm in a lot of circles where through ayahuasca or through smoked mimosa or other different types of DMT experiences, I haven't actually talked to anybody who's, you know, encountered, well, actually I have, I've encountered, I had one friend who's encountered some DMT elves, but it's, uh, it's very interesting. It seems like both cultural and also internal, depending on what you might experience from a, from a certain thing. Um, but potentially that is potentially this technocracy, this, this, technology as a god is actually playing in our psyche like a god and actually psychedelics will start to open open up a, a pathway to see the world through that lens because it's actually what we see you know subconsciously in our own psyche mm-hmm. yeah like i said i'm not i'm not a, I'm, I'm not the, the the psychedelics guy but we'll see like there, there seems To me, there's there's a, let me say it this way, like in terms of, there seems to be, because 
the notion of psychedelics, there's this idea of supplementarity, right? This idea is like, I take this substance, I encounter God. So it's like, I take this mushroom and then I have a spiritual experience. The, let's say the more traditional Christian manner to have a traditional uh, 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 spiritual experience would be, you know, like deny your sins, you, d- you know, fast, pray, vid- do vigils all night and then, you know, for months. And then at some point through that, that kind of, let's say, spiritual effort and spiritual uh, work, then you will have mystical experiences but the mystical experiences are actually not the point like for 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 monks they actually tell you to to ignore your mystical experiences as as much as possible the the point is to become more like to become let's say ontologically go up the ladder you know, be transformed to something else and so the the ai thing is also something like that like it's like we're going to build a machine we're going we're gonna to make this thing. We're going to have this material thing. We don't take it, but we're going to build it. And then it'll be our vehicle towards the transcendent, let's say. Mm-hmm. And so in that sense, that's why I see there's also a relationship, even beyond the, 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 the elves, which I think are part of, actually somewhat part of it, but that there's an idea of like this, 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 this physical shortcut towards the divine maybe is the way to kind of understand it. it's like we're going to build this machine and it's going to become a god for us um i don't know if you see the connection maybe you don't yeah i mean i i don't know i mean i i think i um it is interesting i see how i see how in many ways i do think that psychedelics can be a shortcut but the question is is it a shortcut to the actual divine or is it a shortcut to your own ideas that are actually misleading you in a way that's not helpful. And certainly for my life, it's been nothing but helpful, beautiful, increased my capacity. Like what is the, you shall know a tree by its fruits. What are the fruits? I love people more. I care for people more. I see myself in them, you know, like love your neighbor as thyself. Like, okay, well, what's helped me to do that? Well, my, my path, you know, my prayer has been these medicine journeys. So the fruits of these labors has led me to, you know, more virtue in my life, unequivocally. There's just no denying that. Mm. And so, and, but it's not only psychedelics, it's breath work, it's ecstatic dance. I mean, you think of the whirling dervishes, they didn't take anything, they just danced for a while. You think of the, the sun dance rituals, the fasting, the dancing, the piercing. You think of these many rituals which can lead you to an ecstatic uh, communion with the divine. There's many, many different ways. And differences of opinion about the virtue of both of those things but i think you have to come back to like you shall know a tree by its fruits what is this actually bringing to your life are you more loving compassionate kind does is laughter fall from your lips more easily or less easily is it leading to inflation because it's not like psychedelics are a panacea right oftentimes i've seen them lead to massive levels of dysregulation and inflation of ego it's the and the fruits of these have not have not been beneficial and i think that's because the soil was not prepared for that particular type of seed and and that's that's really the way to look at it so it it, to me it's it's a complicated complicated issue because of the relationship of the individual and the medicine itself and and really like in that example the soil the soil and the water and the sunlight leading to the seed, which may be the medicine, the psychedelic, and then the tree, and then that leads to the fruits. What are the fruits? Well, if the, the water's poisoned, which is the inputs of your community and the sunlight, which is the ideas you have of the divine, and if, the, if your soil was actually with pesticides that were you know, washed through because your body was unhealthy in a variety of ways, there's ways in which the fruits can become toxic as well. Mm. And, uh, and so that's kind of how I would look at that path as it pertains to what's happening. And, and I think for many people it is, you know, the fruits are, are leading to a, a revolution of consciousness, which I think gives me, gives me great hope in potentially steering this new AI monster that seems fucking inevitable that somehow through one way or another, we have to become more conscious, more loving, more kind and le- less, you know, less egocentric and selfish and more, you know, more and less ethnocentric also. We can't just cons- consistently focus on our tribe. We have to become more cosmocentric, 
where we're just, or global centric, where we're looking at the whole world, the whole cosmos in our picture. And, you know, that's going to be necessary and probably even more necessary given the fact that we're going to be building our God based upon our own level of consciousness, which is something that just illuminated to me. It's like, the pressure's on right now. Like, we gotta, we gotta show up. We gotta get better. <laughs> well, there's, you know, it's, the ancient world, the way that they would do it, is, it's interesting because it's very similar to what's going on now. You know, they, if you think of the way that they would build a statue, you know, and then they would, they would open its nostrils, right? And, and they would blow into, like, they would, the, the, the god would enter into the statue and then the statue would become the center of the temple. And people would come and circumambulate and worship and offer, offer sacrifices, right, to this thing. Um, and so sometimes it feels that way, like we're building the body of a god in a way, in a way that is way more than what happened in the ancient times. There's a story in the book of Revelation which seems to be pointing to something like this. I'm not saying that it's AI. I'm just saying the structure of the story seems to be pointing like that, where there is this, you know, this story of the dragon who does, who makes war in heaven. And then with its tail, it wipes, you know, a certain amount of the stars which fall down onto earth. And then you have to imagine that as the angels or the gods that fall onto the earth. And then this 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 dragon comes out of the, the sea, this beast, which is the, let's say the, coming from the dragon comes out of the sea. And then it makes, a, there's the level, these different beasts that are related to this dragon. And one of them makes an image of the beast and it makes a statue basically of the beast. And then the beast, the statue speaks and because the statue speaks and everybody worships the statue and that leads basically to the, to the, let's say the, the kingdom of antichrist, you know, Mm. something like that. And so in a way that it feels like there's something like that going on, because when you say that, like when you say we have to be more globally conscious and more cosmically conscious, I, and I think that that's something a lot of people are talking about. And and I and in some ways I think that that actually worries me because I, I think that the symbolic structure is it's a fractal structure. It's one which doesn't deny the tribal, let's say. The tribal is allowed to exist in communion with higher participations, right? Sure. So it's not yeah. like we deny these levels in order to get to the one the one to, in the top one, it embodies itself at all these levels. So it's like you're a person in a family, in a community, in a tribe, in a group, in a religion. All these things kind of lay themselves out, and 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 I'm worried that, in a way, what exactly what you're saying, is what AI will be. It'll be like a global thing, something which will be so smart and so impressive that it will impose itself as a. Yeah, as yeah. a as a god over, but I don't see that as being good. To be honest yeah. with you, yeah, I mean, if 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 uh, in this case the, the beast or a beast creates an idol in its image and it speaks through that and is worshipped as a god, then we're worshiping a beast, and and that well, especially if if the beast, the thing that's driving the birth of the beast is beast is money. Mm. Like the thing that's driving AI is 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 financial gain. It's like whoever it edges that out, whoever comes on the edge of that, is going to reap massive, massive rewards, and everybody yeah. knows that. And people are willing. So it's like Elon Musk who says basically, "I've been warning you forever, and now because I'm noticing everybody's going in this direction, then I can't. Then I'll I'll, I'll I have to I have to play long at least to a certain extent because." I don't want to fall behind, hmm. and it's, there's going to be a lot of that. So I, I don't see the motivation behind AI. Honestly, I don't see the motivation behind Google, and the things that are going to lead to the AI as being benevolent. Yeah, uh, what you were mentioning about the necessity to both include and transcend different levels of consciousness from the self to the to the community to all 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 people and then in cosmocentric there's uh, a beautiful um song from the songs of Sol- the fourfold song of solomon and if you don't mind me spending three minutes reading it's uh, it actually sure. talks about this in uh in probably the most eloquent way that i've ever i've ever heard 
There is a one who sings the song of his soul, and in his soul he finds it all, full, complete spiritual satisfaction. And there is a one who sings the song of her people. She leaves the zone of her personal soul, which she doesn't find wide enough and not settled in ideal serenity, and attaches herself with tender love to the totality of her tribe. And together with her people, she sings. She suffers their pains, and she takes delight in their hopes. She ponders high in pure ideas about their past and their future, and she investigates with love and the wisdom of the heart the inner content of their soul. And there is a one who widens his soul even further until it expands and spreads beyond the boundary of tribe to sing the song of humanity. His soul is continuously enlarged by the genius of humankind and the glory of this divine image. He aspires towards man's universal purpose and participates his higher holification. And from this living source does he draw the entirety of his thoughts and explorations, his aspirations and his visions. And there is a one who rises even further than this in expansion until she joins herself in unity with all of existence in its totality, with all creatures and with all worlds. And together with all of them, she gives forth song. And this is the one who engages daily in a chapter of song, who is promised that she lives in the emergent world. And there is a one who rises with all these songs together in one unity and all of them send forth their voices. All together they play their melodies, and each pour vigor and life into the other. The sound of jubilance and the sound of joy, the sound of celebration and the sound of exultance, the sound of rejoicing and the sound of holiness, the song of the soul, the song of the tribe, the song of humankind, the song of the cosmos, all flow together within him, all the time, at every moment. And this completeness in its fullness rises to become the song of holiness, a simple song, a double song, a threefold song, a fourfold song, the song of songs of Solomon to the king to whom wholeness belongs. Yeah, that's a, that's a nice image of how the world kind of fits together like a, yeah. like a series of embedded dolls, I'd say. Yeah, and it, it's you run into trouble if you try to skip a, if you try to skip a stage, you know. Then you you really can't, and it's also not true, you know. It's it's that idea that if you don't love yourself, you won't have the love to actually love other people. You know, you'll be in you'll be in constant deficit. It's the same idea. You have to sing the song of your own soul, sing the song of your family, your tribe, sing the song of all people, sing the song of the world. And when you get those out of order. You get very strange, you know, you get very strange behavior that's, you know, out of alignment with actually a, a system of values that really makes sense. No, oh, that, no, you're right. That's, a, that's, a, that's the, let's say the, the right way to understand. And I think that that's something that we can do today. It's, it's like a lot of people are wondering, like, what can we do? What can we do? And I think that aligning those things together is definitely something that we can do, you know, aligning yourself with your family and, aligning your family with your community and you know just fitting all that together is something that we that we we can do without without thinking that we can change the world and we can change these large narratives that are that are huge or like the environment or you know the economy or whatever we can't fix those things but we can definitely like you said you can fix ourselves mm -hmm. and then scale that up slowly towards to and then the reverberations of that you'd be surprised at how how much they can they can be, they can reverberate more than you think, because we all know that communities hold together through saints, you know, through people that embody that right, and therefore people congregate around them, and the world actually gets built around, around people that have that figured out. And so just becoming more yourself might be enough to, you know, to save the world, maybe not completely, but at least play your part in saving the world, yeah, let's totally. say. Yeah. What's, uh, as we come to a close here, what's, uh, what's a symbol that is something that you use to remind yourself uh, of some values, of some, some truth, of some beauty? Uh, is there something that you're particularly drawn to, you know, just personally? 
Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, I'm definitely, I would say the thing that I'm most drawn to is definitely the image of Christ. You know, I met, I make icons for people who don't know. One of the things I do is I actually make religious images for churches. It's one of my, one of my jobs. And that image, I think, is one that I love to to gaze upon and to contemplate as an image of that place where heaven and earth meets. But also, in some ways, it's the reflection of a man as well. Like it, it's actually the it's a human face looking back at me, um, and so. You know, and when I say that the, the image of Christ is a symbol, of course, I'm not saying that Jesus didn't exist. I'm not saying any of that. Like, I believe symbols are instantiated in real things. Like they, they, they actually find body in, 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 the real, in the real world. And so that image for me is kind of, I would say, the, the one that I like to gaze upon to remind myself of, of what's important. Mm. Yeah, it's, uh, it's everything can only be understood in, in paradox, in the paradox of Jesus Christ. Jesus, Yeshua, the guy, and the Christ, which is the energy that is accessible, that all of, that all of us have the, at least the potential to access within ourselves, and how you know he was the first symbol of the one who joined Jesus, the man, with the Christ, and that is, of course, one of the most powerful symbols I think the world has ever uh, the world has ever come upon. Yeah. Yeah, well, thanks for the opportunity to talk to you. It's, yeah. it's, we're in some ways in many di in very different worlds, and so I was curious to know, like, I'm like, what does he want to talk to me about? But uh, <laughs> but it, it was an interesting conversation. No doubt, no doubt, as as it was uh, as it was destined to be. I I think so. I, I really uh, really enjoyed it. So where can people find you and uh, and dive in? Of course, I mentioned the website where I misattributed the author. My apologies to I believe his name was no Robin. worries, but that is the best place to find me. Either so you can look at the symbolicworld.com and there like most of the stuff related to my youtube channel or the different people that are thinking about symbolism that's where you can you can find uh, you can find the stuff and if you're interested in my art you can follow me on instagram or you can look at pagilcarvings.com as well where my where i have my my own iconography there beautiful well thank you so much brother it was a real pleasure yeah it's great to meet you yeah likewise take care everybody Thanks for tuning into this video. Make sure you hit subscribe, follow me at Aubrey Marcus, check out the Aubrey Marcus podcast available everywhere, and leave a comment. Let me know if this video resonated or what else you would like to hear from me in the future. Thank you so much.